Quickly create the monitoring tools to monitor the monitoring tools, etc. Perfect XKCD comic, of course, for what we do. Uh, love that comic. And uh, a little bit about our company vision. So at GoDaddy, our entire goal is to enable small businesses to compete online. So that's anybody from your mom and pop shop who just wants to get a web presence and direct people to maybe their restaurant, to their store, to local business, an international user who wants to start selling things online, or somebody who just wants to start a blog and you know start writing news, that kind of thing. So as far as GoDaddy goes, uh, we do have about 17 million customers, uh, 72 million plus domains, and we have 7,000 plus employees all over the world at current time. Uh, we also have data centers globally, uh, two here in the US, uh, both east and west coast, as well as in uh, Amsterdam to cover Europe, and uh, out in Singapore for our Asian area, as well as uh, some new data centers coming online as part of uh, the EMEA expansion. So a little bit about the agenda we want to go over with you guys today. Uh, we want to discuss the starting challenges that we had when we were bringing Sensu online. Um, we didn't necessarily know that Sensu was going to be the answer, but these are just some of the problems that we wanted to kind of tackle. Um, how Sensu helped us achieve what we needed to do. And then we want to discuss a little bit about the future and what we're excited for. So with that, I'll let McLean to Cool, thanks Tom. Hopefully everybody's having a pretty good uh, experience here, getting some really cool cool and interesting things. So um, let me start with kind of describing a little bit about uh, the history of where we came from. So in our particular circumstance, go back a few years and we had a monitoring team that was set up in such a way that they were responsible for the full stack. That was installing agents, configuring checks, the whole, the whole thing. And if you were a product team and you wanted to add whatever monitoring to your box or to your service, it meant filling out a request and waiting forever, right? Uh, and just it was not a really great experience. You know, there's a very small team, two or three people, kind of just trying to trying to do what they could. And uh, over time, the company kind of grew. We got more and more services, more and more boxes, and unfortunately, just didn't uh, didn't really scale. So, unfortunately, uh, at some point, they kind of broke apart the monitoring team to different parts of the company. Uh, and thus entered the dark times. No monitoring team. Oh no, what, what shall we do? Um, and what kind of happened during this period is different teams in the company started exploring different tool sets, um, including, not limited to, Sensu. Um, and out of this sprung kind of a, a renaissance, right? The company uh, eventually realized, oh, maybe we do need a monitoring team. Um, but let's make it a little bit different this time. Instead of uh, a team that's fully responsible for everything, instead, Let's try to work on providing a platform that people can, can use in their own ways. So when the new monitoring team sprung up, uh, it was, what, two, three people initially, um, we set out and said, hey, we're going to start with uh, self-service as a first-class feature. Definitely want to uh, improve upon what we did in the past. Um, and from that, uh, which was about uh, three years ago, we've grown to nine people now, providing uh, Sensu and a few other services as, as uh, self-service features. So let's take a look at kind of what we provide today. Today we do Sensu as um, a set of uh, self-service things that include enterprise checks and team checks. And by that I don't mean uh, Sensu Enterprise. We unfortunately also call some things that we do uh, enterprise checks, but not, don't want to confuse anything there. Um, by enterprise checks, what I mean is we do the basic health bits. We do disk, memory, CPU, et cetera. That way, every team in the company doesn't have to go and re-implement that or, or, frankly, even mess with that. It's just there. It's just on. When you spin up a box, hooray, you're ready to go. Um, we also do have teams do what are called team checks. And in team checks, they can use their knowledge, their domain knowledge about what they're doing to create checks specific to their tools, their services. Um, and these kind of live side by side. So as you can see here, we've got checks for you know, swap memory, et cetera. We've got a standard for keep lives to make sure you know, a client is up and running, as well as other uh, customization bits. Um, and from this, we had some interesting things that developed. Uh, we use uh, GitHub Enterprise internally. And what kind of organically sprung out of that was a, a kind of open source sense of community, where a team on wherever might create a check for XYZ thing. Another team would kind of ask, hey, has anyone created a check for this XYZ thing? 
team would say, yes, we have, and thus sharing would happen, reuse, really, really good stuff. So um, this is kind of our, our process. So as, a, as an SRE developer, no matter who you are, we made things stupid simple. You commit your checks, your plugins, et cetera, to a GitHub repo. And on the back end, we pipe that off to Jenkins, and we basically build a package that you can deploy on all your clients. We also install all of your check definitions, et cetera, on Sensi servers that we maintain on behalf of our internal customers. And so the internal customer engagement is, is, is incredibly simple. Commit stuff to GitHub through whatever means your team uses, and then deploy those checks out to your clients. So this is an example where, with our enterprise checks, we try to go for one size fits all, but one size does not always fit all. And in the case of where a team says, hey, you know, your, your defaults for memory check are set such that uh, it'll warn at 20% left, or crit at 10% left, um, it doesn't really work out for us. We need something different. We allow a, through variable substitution, a really simple way that per client, teams can go in and say, hey, I need to override these defaults to something that works better for me. Um, we also, within our enterprise checks, take care of a lot of the configuration management elements of deploying things out to boxes, such as uh, we make sure that embedded Ruby is enabled for our stuff. We also take care of things like uh, gem installation. So I don't know if anybody's ever had to deal with uh, gem packaging and installation across boxes, but it is a wonderful experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to simplify that, uh, we have a little thing where in the repo that people commit to, simple flat file of what gems you need. We take care of everything else uh, on their behalf. Cool. Um, and addition from this, we also found that because we were kind of taking care of a lot of the minutia, a lot of the standard things uh, within this platform, people were able to focus a lot more on going really deep within their monitoring systems. They weren't struggling with, how are we going to write that load check today? You know, thing, things of that nature. So let's uh, take it back to Tom here to talk a little bit about the architecture. Cool. So at GoDaddy, for our architecture for Sensu, we needed to solve a problem of allowing the users to be self-service, but we also needed to protect the users from each other when they essentially did something dumb. Uh, we didn't want them to be able to take down monitoring for everybody just by deploying a check because maybe they forgot to comment that JSON, and yes, I think the chef approach or the puppet approach that Yelp is taking is much better than writing raw JSON. I wish we were there, just to call that out. But we kind of came up with this approach. Um, we kind of created a monitoring as a service platform using Sensu where we leverage both shared and exclusive resources. So by shared resources, we have RabbitMQ for the messaging bus, Redis, Sentinel to kind of dictate failover for our HA Redis infrastructure, as well as HA proxy for load balancing. These are systems that we can build multiple clusters in per data center if necessary, or we can build them as small as we need to as if there's not as many people in each data center. And then, as far as the exclusive resources, this is where you start to get into the core of Sensu. So you have a minimum of two servers for HA to allow for failover for Sensu. This is API, Uchiwa, Sensu Server, and Redis running on those systems. And we also have Lighty running on these systems. Uh, we are leveraging Lighty for an auth proxy so that we can use our backend AD systems for access to the API or to Uchiwa itself so we don't have to leave those open. Then, for exclusive resources, we can also scale per team with tertiary Sensu servers. These tertiary Sensu servers are extremely flexible because all they're doing is running Sensu server. They don't run anything else for the system. So all we leverage these for are if we need additional Sensu servers to process result checks during alert storms or because a team has grown too large for two systems to support them. So the reason we kind of needed to do that is because we needed to be able to scale based on team, like I said. So this is a snapshot of what we call our Knockview Uchiwa dashboard. Um, it's terrible, it's red, and uh, it is like that all the time, I promise. Um, but we do have 40,000 clients connected to Sensu across 106 uh, different Sensu clusters. And as you can see from this image, uh, you have somebody like our Aries team out in P3, which is our hosting team. They have approximately 8,000 clients connected to their Sensu infrastructure. So backing them, we have approximately, I think, 30 boxes managing the results and keep alive queues for them. Now, that doesn't make sense 
for a team like our uh, 4GH Linux team out in AMS that has a couple hundred clients. They're fine with just the original two boxes. So what we essentially came up with was some napkin math that if you have 500 clients, two boxes is enough. Anything beyond that for every 500 clients you have, we can add two additional boxes. Now that, uh, that says nothing about checks, so depending on how many checks teams have, that may go up or down. As well as it allows us to, during an alert storm from those 8,000 Aries alerts when we get DDoSed inevitably and everything looks like it's on fire, we just spin up more Sensu servers and continue to process the flames. So now that we've kind of discussed the architecture and some of the ways that we solved some of the problems with self-service that we wanted to provide for GoDaddy, we'd like to talk about how things are terrible. Um, so when we started going down the self-service route, we knew that teams weren't going to love the idea of having to do the work themselves. So we faced the realities of self-service. This again is our Knockview Uchiwa dashboard. I blurred out the server name so that you can't blame any team for these gray checks. And if anybody's used Sensu for any amount of time, you know the gray checks are not valid return codes. So what we're looking at here is approximately somebody who deployed a number of checks out to their Sensu infrastructure and didn't deploy it out to their clients. And it has been running like this for, I don't want to admit how long it's been running like that for, I'll just skip that. Um, but that was some of the stuff that we had to realize with the, you know, so that when teams are going to go self-service, they are going to do terrible and stupid things. Um, some of the other instances of things we've seen is a use of the remediation handler for uh, occurrences one plus. They then allowed that alert to go off for three weeks with remediation running every 60 seconds across about 500 boxes, essentially setting their Sensu servers on fire because it couldn't keep up with all the handlers that they wanted to use. Hey, it's automated. Yeah, it is automated. So um, that is just some of what we kind of uh, ran into. Um, we also ran into some network layer scaling troubles. Uh, why don't you go ahead and talk about that? Sure. Thanks, Tom. So networks, what's to say about networks? Um, so some of the interesting things that we ran into were uh, we had some, um, I guess, uh, probably older firewalls in the environment. And they were set up in such a way that um, beyond a certain number of new connections to the firewall, embryonic connections, uh, it would effectively just stop uh, passing through additional connections. But also not send a reset packet to the clients, letting them know, hey, I threw away your, your, your traffic here. Uh, so what we would experience is that a um, network disruption event would happen. Um, some sort of massive denial of service, for example, or other uh, human caused things. Um, and so there's, there'd be this thundering herd of Sensu clients trying to all connect back into RabbitMQ going through this firewall. Well, some of them would make it, and unfortunately, some of them would be lost along the Oregon Trail of packets. Um, and unfortunately, this created uh, a lot of keep alive storms for us where you know, network disruption would happen, we would hope that everything would reconnect and be happy, but it unfortunately was not. Um, one of the ways we initially solved that was by taking the RabbitMQ server, instead of having all of the thousands and thousands of connections go through this not so great firewall that we could not replace, uh, put RabbitMQ outside of that firewall so then all of the clients could connect into that, and then just a handful of connections would come from our sensor server back into that. And that helped a bit. Um, we also had some similar issues where other occurrences would happen where the network would kind of drop out for clients. And um, unfortunately, the way that the client handling behaved, it would end up in either half open or half closed connection and just kind of hang out. Hey, no work to do. I'm a Sensu client. Good times. Um, until the 15 minute uh, TCP keep alive would happen, or sorry, yeah, TCP keep alive would happen, and then you know, it would drop off. Meanwhile, Sensu keep alive alerts going off for the box, no good. Um, at some point, uh, some of the AMQP heartbeat bits were added to the Sensu client code. Awesome. Uh, we were able to put a uh, AMQP um, you know, transport keep alive configuration on all of our clients significantly better. Um, that way, when uh, if a client stopped receiving traffic from the RabbitMQ server, it would go, hey, it's, it's been a while, you know, X amount of seconds. It would tear down the TCP connection and force a reconnect back to RabbitMQ. Super, super happy times. So Redis, Redis is good times. Um, so with Redis, with our, uh, some of our initial architecture, um, we had HAProxy 
sitting in front of you know, a Redis uh, primary and, and secondary nodes. And uh, during scheduled and unscheduled failovers and things like that, um, we would hope that HA proxy would shift the traffic over to whoever the new primary was and sense who would do its thing. Um, unfortunately, the realities of that were that sometimes um, HA proxy, sense API, et cetera, would get into a state where it would be talking to the read-only copy of Redis, um, which does very bad things uh, if you're expecting you know, the client registry to get updated with its last check-ins. Um, that also led to a significant number of uh, Keep Alive events for us. Um, so we, uh, eventually there was a code put into the client that supported um, talking directly to Redis Sentinel, the thing that kind of manages state of who's primary within Redis land. And uh, by doing that, we completely ripped HA proxy out of the picture and it was significantly better. Um, also, we had encountered a very high load on our HA proxy boxes and after changing that load went to zero for some reason, I don't know. But um, yeah, so that was an interesting case with, uh, with Redis. So uh, what else? Let's see. Um, handlers. So uh, we have kind of an external notification system that we funnel all of our alerts and things into and do things with them. Um, when we would encounter alert storms, uh, we noticed that our Sensu servers or Sensu VMs would spike heavily with regard to CPU. And that caused kind of a cascade effect where um, CPU, those VMs would spike up. Uh, Client registry updates would kind of start to fail to happen. Connections to Redis may, may or may not time out. Connections to the API may or may not time out. Just it was bad times. Um, and we kind of took a look at what was the major cause of this. And it always seemed to be these, these handlers that we were spinning up, uh, especially in the storm conditions. So we rewrote our primary notification handler as an extension and made a huge, huge difference in terms of CPU consumption for, for our VMs. Um, just absolutely night and day. Um, we were able to process significantly more events per second by changing from a you know, forking handler to um, an actual native extension. Um, and that, that uh, made us be able to take on pretty much any um, alert storm without running into uh, CPU exhaustion issues. So, oh man, I kept that slide, damn it. Oh, jeez. So, uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, cool. So we've talked a little about uh, kind of the architecture. We've talked about you know some some learnings we had along the way and things like that. You know what's what are the end results, right? So um, today we have forty thousand clients connected to our sensor infrastructure. We've got some eleven thousand plus checks that people are running in the environment. Um, we also have kind of culturally each team in the company that's making use of this has really embraced monitoring as like one of their. One of, their, one of their pieces of their own destiny, right? They've, you know, they can choose to take on as much or as little of monitoring as they're able to or as they, as they see fit. Um, and concurrently, we also have uh, consistency for all of our boxes with regard to just the basic health checks. You know, is the box on, uh, memory disk, CPU, et cetera? Is that doing okay? Um, and that, that has really instilled a stronger confidence by using Sensu within the monitoring space in that, it used to be maybe that people were kind of a little unsure if things were actually broken, like, hey, something's going on. I'm not quite sure the monitoring tools are working right, right? Well, things have changed to the state where people have very strong confidence in using Sensu in our, our monitoring stack, where they know with certainty that, yeah, that thing is down, right? And it's just, it's a, it's a much more uh, positive environment today with, um, with, with that kind of setup. So, Tom, would you like to talk about a little bit about the future? Sure. Sure. So yeah, um, you know, I think Sean touched on it a little bit earlier. The future looks good. I don't have a talk track for this slide. I just liked it. So one thing we're obviously excited for, Sensu 2.0. I um, couldn't decide between this pick or the hype train pick, but we are extremely excited for it. Um, you know, even though we developed a uh, pipeline for deploying the checks out, um, one of the things that we're extremely excited to see happen is the idea that Sensu itself can act as that config management layer out to the client. So a client connecting over and I'm subscribed to these checks. Oh, here's the checks you need to run. Have a nice day. And we don't have to worry about any layer beyond that. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I'm looking forward to, especially with, uh, I think, about 1,000 gray alerts that I have in our Knockview dashboard that I'd like to get rid of. 
Um, what else are you excited for, McLean? Uh, I'm super excited for the self-contained transport, uh, for the self-contained client registry. I think those have definitely been um, some interesting pieces that people kind of deal with until they figure things out, mostly kind of. Um, it'll, it'll be great to see that just all self-contained, right? You deploy the Sensu, and it's not deploy the Sensu and the RabbitMQ and the HA proxy and the Redis and the ah, right. It's it's just the the Sensu the Sensu server, and that'll be really really fantastic to move into that. Um, another thing we're excited for, um, especially since we've been using Sensu since uh, what 2014, 2013. The year was 1887. 1887 yes. sounds about right. Um, we wanted to, you know, just discuss the community a little bit. I'm excited to see where the community goes uh, with Sensu 2.0. Um, we've seen a lot of growth in the community and just the conversation, engagement in GitHub and things of that nature since starting using Sensu uh, way back in the day, version 13, I believe, was our first version. Um, so I'm just excited to see kind of where that goes and how things change. Um, it's also nice to be here and see how other people are leveraging Sensu. You know, there's things that even though we've been using it for years, we haven't necessarily thought of or haven't necessarily had time to go down the path of. So it's nice to see how others are implementing the same system in their uh, enterprise or in their startups. And yeah, I mean, as far as community goes, um, there's, there's interesting ways to get involved with that. And it's not just, you know, not just code, not just pull requests, although those are awesome too. Um, I think, uh, you know, from the kind of, you know, consuming Sensu, um, I think a lot of the interesting things that have happened with regards to some of the architecture and things like that are folks that are sort of relaying through GitHub issues, how they're using Sensu and kind of the challenges that they're running into. I think that's that's been one of the, for me, kind of observing uh, Again, as the consumer of that, I think that's really, you know, really drawn up some interesting solutions that have had more than just, you know, fixing an issue here and there, but sort of uh, evolving the state of Sensu. So definitely get involved. Um, I don't want to say like flood, flood the issues with bug reports, but uh, just if, if you've got things that you've encountered, um, definitely, definitely speak up, you know, try to, try to provide those also in a data driven way where you're able to kind of say, hey, here's how I was able to reproduce this thing or, you know, here's the criteria for a encountering that thing. So. And uh, it wasn't necessarily there when we wrote this, but I am thankful that we are now on Slack and not on IRC. So that is a <laughs> big, big improvement. Um, so that is everything that we have for you today. Um, you know, we will be here uh, if you want to talk out in the hallways or reach out to us on, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, shoot us an email. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? I thought for sure there would be, there we go. Just very simple. So you have 14,000 hosts or clients connected to, to your cluster. How many clusters did you mention that you have running to support those? Uh, we have 106 clusters 106 at this point. Clusters. And there's 11,000 check for uh, 40,000 hosts. I mean, does it mean that you have like check with like almost duplication of each other with different names? So or? I think by its very new nature, Uchiwa's dashboard on Nakpu is going to duplicate the checks that you're seeing there because it is loading all 106 uh, data centers um, in that view. So 11,000 checks will include um, you know plugins from the community that we've pulled into our enterprise checks, which there's probably about 20 of yes. uh, per. So that's about 2,000 right there that we know are duplicated. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, 4,000 of those are the uh, are basically the, the duplicated checks. Everything else is all team customization of some sort. Okay. So do you use subscriptions at all then at this scale? I'm sorry? Subscription checks, or is they all standalone checks? Or yeah. mix? Yeah, so the question is, uh, do we use uh, subscriptions for our checks? Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. Um, in fact, uh, so one, one thing to call out is that we um, explicitly by design don't support uh, standalone checks. You know, people can do those, but you're kind of on your own, uh, mainly because one, Supporting those at scale is kind of a pain, and two, debugging standalone checks can be a pain uh, as well, right? Like client name foo, hmm, wonder where that came from, right? Um, but yeah, so we, for example, our enterprise checks, uh, as long as you have a subscriber of Linux host, you get all the default checks out of the gate. And we encourage teams to try to uh, put some very light design in their choice around subscribers, so that way, you know, you're not just calling everything server, you know, like uh, web servers, maybe call them web, 
database servers, maybe call them database. But yeah, we absolutely encourage and by design want people to use subscribers. Cool. Good questions. Any others? Maybe take one more. Ah, Kyle. With such a large self-serve kind of thing, do you have name collisions? Because, and how do you deal with that? Um, so the way that we dealt with naming collisions is why we have 106 um, instances of Sensu. So each uh, business service is essentially given their own um, instance of Sensu, and they're free to do what they want with it at that point. Um, the only thing that we kind of protect is the naming that we provide to our enterprise checks, um, but we prepend all of those with enterprise law um, to help prevent that. So if somebody wanted to, for some reason, create their own CPU check on top of Enterprise, they certainly could. Um, they would just have to name it differently. But that's essentially how we dealt with that. Thank you guys both. Thank you. Thank you.